Hello, everyone, to the latest edition of the Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Richard Bishop from Bishop Consulting. Richard, thanks for joining us here today. Excited to talk to you. You have a tremendous level and years of experience in a variety of different industries. Autonomous, I think ADAS will be our focus probably here today. Mm -hmm. Maybe to start out with Richard, explain a little bit of your background, explain a little bit what you're doing today. And then after that, once viewers and listeners have a better idea who we're talking to here, then let's jump in together and reimagine mobility together. Okay. Uh, yes, Stefan, really nice to be invited. Thanks. Thanks for that. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. I've been in the automated driving space since 1991. And people, sometimes people almost fall out of their chairs when they hear that. How can that be possible? But I'll, I'll save in, save, save all the, uh, the background there, but, uh, it's been happening for a long time. And I'm, I was with the U S department of transportation then. And after a while, as things heated up, I decided to jump out and, and be a, a consultant, sort of a, a strategic guy. And, and so I've been surfing the wave since really the like DARPA urban challenge days and, and working with the, some of the early starter players like Peloton technology and trucking working with the car manufacturers as, as they got into this space and in, in ADAS. And so I, I right. try to be a guy who's, you know, got my arms around everything that's going on in the space gets harder and harder and, and try to bring a level of, you know, sort of settledness, feet on the ground, not too crazy hand wavy sort of stuff and bring a perspective. So that's, that's what I do. And I'm, I've been pleased to uh, that it's been valuable to folks over the years. Very good. So perfect. So you just said you, you're the guy that's trying to put your arms around things. I think those arms are way longer wingspan than any NBA player I probably know. <laughs> but let's use this as a metaphor and let's say, how much did you have to get your arms around in 1991 that you said you already started with with autonomous? Uh, yeah. You contrast that with today. I think that would be a fantastic <laughs> start. I mean, we're not looking yet into the future. We're just looking into the past. Yeah. And how yeah. over the last 91, now I have to do, I have to do math, 33 <laughs> years yeah we moved to today how much wider bigger stronger your arms had to be here share a little bit about that richard what a great question well i i came in from a dod like i said and i was the first electronic engineer they had hired in the federal highway administration in in the previous 20 years you know so i was seen as a, a guru because i knew what system engineering was and fancy things like that i knew what gps was and that was a very energetic time because they were developing this idea of intelligent vehicle highway systems and this classic idea that if the cars interact with the roadway in various ways, everything gets better, traffic and, and you name it. But it was also a, a kind of a frothy time because a lot of money, uh, federal money was shifting out of defense into civilian because the Berlin Wall had just come down. And so a big old program came into our, our, our office. Congress told us to do an automated highway system. That was the hmm. terminology then. And I was that double E they just hired. So they said, hey, this, this is for you, Richard. Go, go do it. And we, we did an amazing activity that's really not that well known. We, a consortium was formed with General Motors at the lead, uh, as well as Delco at the time. We had Carnegie Mellon University. We had uh, UC Berkeley you know, all sorts of players, Caltrans. And we did a major demo as directed by Congress. You can go to YouTube, Demo 97, San Diego, and there there we are on I-15 running automated vehicles. And so back to your question, in, in a sense, you know, I thought we were the only thing in town, but the Europeans had done work in the late 80s in that. Whoa. And, of course, the old timers where I was working at Federal Highway Administration they could go back to the early 80s where there was a major program working with Ohio State University that for some reason when Ronald Reagan became president, he thought that was kind of silly and, and axed it, but it was really hot. And that was 10 years before and oh. things before that. So, so now, as you say, contrast it with now. And it's, you know, it's funny. It was crazy frothy maybe three years ago. Maybe that was the, the peak of the froth. And some of the companies went away, of course, but the maturing wow. of many of these companies is really impressive. Waymo being one in RoboTaxi, the way Level 3 
we can get into this later, but a level three operations for passenger car yeah. was like a thing and then it wasn't a thing and now it's a thing again well, for some good reasons. And and yet then yeah. there's this sort of very low level thing going on of little startups keep popping up because you can almost buy a, de a decent automated driving capability yeah. off the shelf. And then you it's all about your business approach. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. And that's it's really the that's the hardest thing in my job is keeping track of all those guys. Interesting. So Let's let's go back to 2019, right? Where I felt like there was not a single OEM out there, at least in Europe and in the US. Asia, you've heard a little bit less about it, at least from my perspective. Yeah. But there was not a an OEM in the Western world that didn't say by 21 latest, Richard, latest 22, you will drive autonomously, right? Clearly then over the next few years. Less and less and less and less people talked about it. The next thing then you knew is Argo AI goes away. VW Ford no longer interested in it, at least seemingly, right? And now we're here today. For me, it was always interesting to see these strong proclamations that then didn't follow through because we always kind of felt like we were 90% there and still 90% away, right? And I'm not sure this has changed no, much. Yeah. Yeah. What I want to know from you is, though, I feel it has changed from the perspective as we refocused on passengers to level three, as you mentioned just now, and on heavy duty and certainly off-road agricultural. We're still pushing level four, if not level five. Certainly in agriculture, we've seen some tremendous technologies mm -hmm. that a, mm -hmm. a John Deere, a Case New Holland. Right. Uh, a caterpillar has deployed almost unbeknownst to the world. There is automation going on to levels we're not realizing, right? Yeah. But yeah. How do you see that? Do you see it similar, this transformation from passenger vehicles leading the pack to passenger vehicles going back to more ADAS up to level three? And then the heavy duty truck guys really taking the lead and saying, there is a business case, we can do this, mm -hmm. uh -huh. there is an ROI behind it, et cetera, et cetera. Really interested in your perspective. Uh, yeah, beautifully framed. Yeah, you know, in the truck side, in the freight side in general, it it's level four. You know, the, it's no point in talking about level three. It's about re oh, removing yeah. the driver, and there's economic reasons to do that. Safety, too, but main, mainly economic. And that's why there's so much money in that, and there are very solid players. I was just at CES. Torque was uh, there, yeah. Aurora, Kodiak Plus. These this is serious engineering. You know, these all these companies have really matured and they've got partnerships across the tier ones. Uh, it's really solid stuff. On the car side, yeah, there there was that frothiness. I think if I remember the name right, it was the Audi CEO that Scott Keo, if I remember his name right. He said in at CES I don't know, at least five years ago, <laughs> hey, we're going to, by 2020, you know, level four fully automated vehicles. Maybe it was even 2015 when that happened. So, yeah, that's that's behind us. You know, for a while, there the yeah. the auto o OEMs were really getting into Robotaxi and Mercedes partnered yeah. with Bosch, for instance. And that was, there was a turning point there because right about at the exact time that Bosch was going to start running these Mercedes vehicles in San Jose, California. They were about to launch, and that's when Mercedes formally pulled back and said, nope, we're not doing that anymore. Uh -huh. And I'm so sorry for those engineers, you know, ready to launch that. Yeah. So, but there's a little bit left. Volkswagen, sure. in the study I just published, you know, they're still pretty serious about their, their robotaxi, their Moya, and they see that yeah. moving towards passenger car at some point. Toyota also has really pulled back from their, their woven city activity. Uh, and at the same time, they're still talking level four. They're, those are big companies. There's only two of them, but those are big companies. And then they, they may go there. GM pulled back as well from, you might recall, Ultra Cruise, which was yep. to take uh, level two hands off on the streets, and on most streets. And it was very yep. ambitious. I didn't expect that to even show up and it did and now they pulled back from that because of the hassles and problems with crews yeah uh, yeah so that that brings me to the next question perfect intro here richard so ultra cruise or, or whatever system we want to call it not just on major highways but on major streets right 
Is it a pause that we're seeing? So are we shelving it? Are we shelving it for a year or two? Are we shelving it because of technical reasons? Are we shelving mm. it or pausing it because of societal pressure saying, hey, you killed somebody, you dragged somebody yeah. in GM's um, case? Are we shelving it, but you're thinking it's more like a five or 10 years because OEMs or companies are scared? Are we shelving it because the technology is not there? I hear a lot of different people and I'm very interested right. from your perspective on, on yeah. what you're seeing here. Thanks, thanks for that, because I make this point whenever I can that the RoboTaxi players, one player had a really rough fourth quarter of 2023, and that was Cruz. Nevertheless, it's it what they had was was and is very effective self driving technology, very effective, um, and and yet things happened, and they did need to do a reset, and they did need to do a, a safety culture reset, management leadership reset. However, sticking with Cruz for a moment, you know, to do a reset of culture, while it's not easy, doesn't take years. Uh, you know, if your technology was fundamentally flawed, you, you're gonna spend years to do that. So I think Cruz will be back within sometime this year, middle of this year, in a very humbled way. Things are just vastly different. Mary Barra looks yep. at it very differently, but but hasn't turned it off. Well, so we're, we're going to continue to see this uh, very strong right. level four robo-taxi activity happen. And in some cases, that's backed by or part of a passenger car OEM such that they'll they'll be pulling from that. I just think that the 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 passenger car OEMs are much more uh, sober about it or or subdued and they know it's not existential for them. Um, yep. Level 3 to to me is the is sort of the holy grail in the sense that for the first time after all this ADAS you really can do something else with your brain for a large portion, if not all of the trip. Yep. And if customers are getting that, you know, they're, that's, that's, that is the huge utility of it. Yeah, sure, they won't full level four anywhere at some point, but, but that's level three is a very big deal for a retail product. Yeah, I completely agree. I drive a level two, level two plus on highways and a blue cruise without making advertising here, but uh, it works very well. Mm. My commute is an hour, and out of that hour, I'm on a highway probably 45 minutes. If I had that 45 minutes to truly do my emails in the morning and in the yeah. evening going home, I mean, that is for sure uh, a tremendous valuable thing to, to buy as part of a vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. So if we take that for a moment, and you made the comment about GM or Cruise, which I think is true for many of the more serious, reputable, and, and the ones that have shown the technology working in the field, right? I would say us engineers or us technology geeks appreciate the technology and look at the data and saying, besides all the heartfelt and, and very sad things that happen, accidents, we can still make a point that those things driving things, the vehicles, are still maybe safer than the human driver, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, I know there's a lot of data and the internet produces even more data for counterpoints and pro points or whatever. But how do we get, so a totally different question for you, Richard. How do we get the public to embrace the technology and not just see the flaws? Because we can call about our flaws here on the call in a heartbeat, right? I can call Jay's flaws. He can call my flaws. It's natural, right? We're not perfect. So there will nothing be ever perfect. And certainly me as a driver, I'm by far not perfect. But how do we get the general population, how do we get the non-technical people, right, which is still the majority of the world, the majority of the U.S., and that's a good thing. But how do we get them convinced, right? I mean, we have the problem with electric vehicles. We have to convince the general public, mm -hmm. right? right? Hydrogen is another one. Start-stop systems, quite frankly, in the U.S., we probably still have to educate oh, yeah. some people that, you no, know, no, your vehicle didn't stall. It's okay, you know. Yeah. What's wrong with my car? Yeah. How do, how do we do this when it comes to autonomous, both both on the trucking side, right? Because I hear a lot of people say, mm -hmm. I better not be driving next to a semi that's autonomous or I'm going to slam on the brakes and then drive away because I'm so yeah. scared. How do we get the public educated and not just educated, but comfortable it's with this? Even. It's, it's, it's 
data, you know, it's magnitude of data. And Waymo has been very good in, in publishing highly regarded technical papers about, you know, their, their track record. They're up to 7 million driverless miles now. Compare that to 10 years ago. Who would have thought? But 7 million driverless passenger miles with the public inside those vehicles. And Cruz put out some pretty good data, not that, not as definitive. And nevertheless, 7 million miles, that doesn't cut it, you know, compared because the NITS, you know, the, the crash fatality statistics are always per 100 million miles. So we will get there gradually. I think on the, on the truck side, it, it is, it's obviously different because they haven't gone to a full driverless mode yet. At least the long haul guys. There's one one company, Gaddick, that's doing that in short haul. Yeah. And and this does appear to be the year in which f- full driverless will be out there from at least three truck AV companies, and that's Aurora, Kodiak, and yeah. and Gaddick with their next generation driverless system, which is scalable. So we're in this in between place. Yeah. If things look or pointing in the right direction. We need a lot more data. Do you do you think because we had that at the beginning of of EVs right where where OEMs or us as suppliers as well we're always told make sure there's no accident make sure there's no fires because we don't want this technology to be hindered by a public spectacle so to speak of of one isolated incident right yeah do, do you think there's a certain hesitancy in in the in the AV space as well because of this. Or is it really all tied together with the same as we've just talked about? We just need more data and, and we can only get this by going out. So we have to be brave in going out. What, what, what do you see there? Yeah, I think it's the latter. We have to continue to be brave and, and be out there. Brave in a sober way, you know, and yeah. Waymo seems to be a, just the gold standard for that right now. And, and Aurora is, is one of the strong ones in terms of re- reporting data at a, at a nicely packaged way yeah yeah just be be the be the big the big boy the big guy who's who says look i'm gonna do this responsibly it's not gonna be flashy it's not gonna be flashy just one one day at a time three more questions one is over the last few years you heard more and more that china even in the av space is is pulling away from the u.s and europe similar to what people are saying they do in the in the EV space, or at least in the battery technology space, right? Do you see this too, Richard, with all the different people you're talking to, or do you see it maybe different that we have different regulations and laws that allows the Chinese maybe to be more brave, if you want to use mm-hmm. that word again, mm-hmm. or be more adventurous or pushing technology more? Or yeah, yeah. How, how do you see that? Yeah, re- remember you asked me at the beginning, well, where is it hard to? keep my arms around what's happening in China is very hard to figure out. It's, it's kind of a more, more frothy environment in terms of news reports and this and that. It, it's hard to suss that out, but I'm, I'm convinced there's some real stuff, very strong, legit stuff going on over there. And it's, it's been interesting to see that in, in, in my study of ADAS that, that I did the last few months that the, some of the car companies they'll go from their home market was this uh, maybe it's hyundai or, or japan and for level three rather than going from their home market straight to the u.s they go to china because mm-hmm. there's so much going on there particularly yeah. because l3 and these other advanced systems show up on their premium electric vehicle and if it's electric there's a whole nother reason to go to china well mm-hmm. that there's, I've heard talk that I am skeptical of that the, the Chinese government is going to equip highways and really make everything go faster because they're doing that. And they, they may or may not do that, but you know, that's just not needed for automated cars. And so no. that's an example of the, the frothiness. Okay. Okay. When, when you look at Europe and let's lose Europe and U.S. because again, let's, let's leave China out for the moment because of your, your, what you just mentioned, difficult to, to assess a little bit to some degree, but passenger vehicle and heavy duty trucking, right? Both, each of them, which, which players do you see as leaders in, in, mm. in those two areas, both in Europe and the U.S. and, and why maybe at least with a short yeah. explanation? Yeah, passenger vehicle. Um, it's all about L three, and right the ones in play right now. You know, with product 
eminent product is BMW, Mercedes, Volvo. I think that's everybody. I feel like I'm missing somebody. And they're they're ready to go. But the the tech works. It's a matter of easing in with the regulatory environment wherever they are. It's pretty straightforward in Europe, which is how it always is. Things move slowly there, but you know where you stand yep. <laughs> in the U.S. Right. Kind of the other way around. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I've been saying lately that, yeah, Mercedes is, is, you know, getting permission in the U S yes. from Nevada and California. That doesn't mean that much is because you don't need permission in any other state is because it's a whole nother thing, you know, yeah. it's a federal government role, but Mercedes hasn't said this, but I, I think they're going to spread to lots of states, if not the whole country by like the end of this year, because the tech is ready for that. And as I understand it, the, the tech is there for full speed range, not just traffic jam assist. It's a matter of them flicking a switch and, and it's gone. It's, it's out there. Yep. So it's the tech is ready. It's just a matter of sort of tiptoeing through the, the early regulatory space. Yeah. Yeah. Trucking, I, I guess on, on trucking, I think uh, Aurora is, is super strong and, and they're more out there with information because they're a publicly traded company. But others who are equally strong don't quite put as much info out there. Torque, owned by Daimler Trucks, very, very strong. And in the Vita, in the short haul B2B world, Gaddick that I mentioned, they yeah. are just raking in the customers. <laughs> they, the customers see the value of running a box truck 10, 20, 40, 80 miles, but it logistically that works and they're doing it with an automated level four vehicle. So when it comes to freight, you start you know, it all starts splitting up in all the use cases, but it, there's good, strong business to be made in all of these places. Well, I just had one more question before I come to my final one, Richard. And you alluded to a little bit, right? Europe, it takes a long time. Then you have a regulation and that regulation sits and doesn't change. So you can plan for it. You know, when you execute something, you can deploy it. Not always the case in the US, right? Sometimes dependent on who's in the White House, sometimes depending on who's in Congress, Senate, making changes, who's pushing, who's not. I've heard both sides when it comes to autonomous technology. One side said we need regulation so we can have something we can test against, something we can defend ourselves against from a legal perspective because regulations come with a framework. Yeah, That really helps the acceleration of technology innovation as we reimagine mobility. And other ones are saying, no, we don't, because once regulations is there and everybody just focuses on just meeting that regulation and you're you're constricting some mm -hmm. degree, to some degree innovation what do you believe is true well you know we talked early on about the the froth of five to seven years ago if not for that froth <laughs> yeah. we would be nowhere right now and that was because of lack of regulations or anything stopping things and if oh. not for that venture capital fueled froth where would the oems be they might just be thinking about it in the research lab right now. It's uh, true. Because their an OEM's uh, business model is to sell cars, you know, and you're successful. Yeah. And same for truck OEMs. Yeah. I think, so I think the nature of the U.S. environment has been vitally important to movement and, and maturity to get us where we are now yeah. with automated driving. And certainly, as you just mentioned, it never helps that you have investors and companies willing to spend a lot of money to advance the technology or becoming leaders in the technology, right? As, as yeah. you just mentioned, that obviously has been always an advantage of the U.S. capital markets to uh, to advance technologies. Yeah. Rick, last question for you. It's been great. Different question. What's going to be your next car you buy and why? <laughs> ah, the next car will be yeah. a level three car. I'm so Mercedes, gonna... is that what you're saying? You're going to buy a Mercedes? Yeah, then I've got got some angst because I have clients in the OEM space that that haven't got L3 out there already. Okay. So yeah, that's that's I'll have to figure that one out. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm ready for that. And you I, actually, or... I, I'll, I, real quick, I my first you know advanced ADAS car was a 2015 Infiniti Q50, which had lane centering, and I think the first vehicle in the U.S. to have lane centering. It was so early that nobody even thought about hands-on wheel detection, you know, <laughs> not an issue. So I can, I can drive this thing and, you know, on the interstate for hours at a time with no driver inputs on my part. Oh, so um, at least I have that. 
But yeah, I'm ready for level three. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Very insightful. Thank you for your your expertise and insights here and for your long arms helping us reach around this and and help us reimagine mobility together here. Thank you. 